I'm John Anderson, the secretary, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our chair, Derek Williams, to give tonight's talk. Um, Derek has been chair of the Wagner Society of Scotland uh, since 2017, and in addition, he also supervises our website and is in control of the Zoom, Zoom communication. So if anything goes wrong tonight, you can blame Derek. Um, he's a teacher of composition, orchestration and piano at uh, the University of Edinburgh and is self-employed as a composer, a conductor, musical director and record producer. So without further ado, uh, I, we greatly look forward to uh, uh, Derek giving his talk on Siegfried Wagner, Living in the Shadow of Pater Familias. Over to you, Derek. Thank you very much, John, for your kind introduction. Now, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, so let's just go back a tad. All right, so obviously that's the title, Siegfried Wagner, Living Under the Shadow of Pater Familias. And slide two, the Wagner dynasty, I had to pay 12 pounds for that photograph in high resolution. And you can see Cosima, Siegfried, uh, and Richard in left to right order. It was in the early morning of 6th of June in 1869 in the lovely three-story villa at Tribsham that Richard's and Cosima's third illegitimate child, Siegfried, was born. Cosima herself was the illegitimate daughter of Franz Liszt. Certainly, so far as his birth went, Siegfried's emergence lived up to his extraordinary parents. According to an entry in Cosima's million word diary, and I'm not kidding, um, the room was caught in an orange blaze of sunlight reflecting off her portrait set, transfigured in celestial splendor. It is perhaps unsurprising that such an efflorescent diary entry was in fact penned by her husband. Nietzsche, still a family friend at that time, was a guest in the house but slept soundly while Cosima was hemorrhaging severely as she delivered the Bayreuth Festival's future director to the world. This is an interior view of the uh, description. After Siegfried's birth, Wagner composed the Siegfried Idol as a birthday present to Cosima. It was first performed on Christmas morning, uh, 1870, by a small ensemble of 15 musicians from the Tonhalle Orchestra Zurich, crammed onto the staircase decorated with hundreds of roses leading to Cosima's bedroom, awakening her in the process. Conductor Hans Richter, Richter whom we can see surrounded by the Wagner family, had sailed out to the center of Lake Lucerne so not to be heard teaching himself how to play the trumpet in order to play the brief trumpet part, which lasts only 13 bars. Uh, Cosima wept. Now let me die, she sighed to him after two repetitions of the work had been performed. Wagner replied, it would be easier to die for me than to live for me. The piece was originally verbosely titled Tribschen Edel with Fiddy's Birdsong and the Orange Sunrise and Wagner's opera Siegfried, which premiered in 1876, incorporates music from it. Fiddy was the family's affectionate contraction of Siegfried's name. Here is a 1927 recording of a radio broadcast of Siegfried himself conducting a performance of the Edel by the London Symphony Orchestra. During the six years, obviously there's a lot more where that came from. 
Um, during the six years Richard Wagner spent at Tribschen, 1866 to 72, he also completed De Meistersinger and recommenced work on the ring after a 12 year break. It was thus an almost unmatched period of productivity and happiness. And Cosima joined Richard permanently in 1868 after her divorce from von Bülow, and the couple were finally married the year following the birth of Siegfried. In his book, The Wagner Experience, Paul Dawson Bowling writes, no summary view of Richard Wagner's character would be complete without hearing something from his son, Siegfried. Both Wagner himself and Cosima were such driven, damaged personalities that it is remarkable that they could avoid the common phenomenon of repetition compulsion. Instead of visiting the same mistakes on their offspring from a belief that their own damage had made them the fine figures that they were, they provided happy childhoods for their children, allowing them mental space and creative freedom. This enabled Siegfried to grow up into a benign and non-obsessive personality, quite unlike his parents. Yet Siegfried grew up to be a musician and an opera composer like his father. He was a long lasting testimonial to all that his parents gave him and he has left us a simple and uncontrived description of his life as a child. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is them as a ch child. Um, this is Siegfried's uh, memoirs. Happy the man who has a carefree childhood. No frost or tempest in later life can dispel the warmth that the sunbeams of a happy infancy can bring to a human soul. Such a childhood as that enjoyed by myself and my sisters and for what we are, for that, we are eternally grateful to our parents. Their aim is to bring us up as happy, true human beings. Sombre faces were not allowed. If my sisters had to slave over written homework and the sun tempted them outside, I was soon sent to my parents. Papa, I would call, I'm all on my own, have no one to play with. In the garden. Can't my sisters come into the garden too? And within moments, all of us five were romping in the garden. In this way, the educational principles of my mother, who had been taught, brought up entirely according to the rules of the Ancien Regime, were often thwarted by those of my father. But genial by nature, she finally acquiesced in these disruptions to her plans. Even afternoon visits to the cake shop, our greatest pleasure was to go to Lorena's famous coffee shop in Venice. Even these she agreed to when she saw what pleasure it gave my father to treat us with sweets. As a result, we were not unduly troubled by lessons. Our beautiful garden at Vinefield was our school. Our school friends were dogs, hens, canaries, and also, I think, salamanders and frogs, which hidden in the cupboards were supposed to feel at home, though they no doubt would have felt much more home at, in Wharton. I have only a vague recollection of the first important event of my childhood, the laying of the foundation stone at the Peschpiel House in 1872. My family told me that I'd been exceptionally well behaved at the age of three. When I was asked what I had understood of the festival address at the age of three, I answered, age three, German men, good men. Of decisive influence on my whole development was were our repeated trips to Italy. Tired of the everlasting gray skies of Germany, I remember my father shaking his clenched fist at the clouds and shouting, those damned potato sacks. He crossed the Alps with his whole family and with the generous support of King Ludwig II in order to forget his cares and troubles even if only for a time, and to enjoy the sun, the visual arts, and the carefree life of the Italians. A first such journey was made possible not only by the king's help, but also by the fee for his festival march, which had just arrived and was very generous by the standards of the time. Following the first Bayreuth festival, which, although a brilliant artistic success, proved a financial disaster, our journey took us via Verona, Venice, and Bologna to Rome and Naples. My happiest memory of this period was the performance of my father's early symphony, to mark my mother's birthday. It was the third time I'd seen him conduct. That's the end of his recollection. But to me, there is a genuine, me, Derek Williams, there is a genuine warmth of feelings, warmth of feelings sprinkled with a delightful sense of humor manifest in Siegfried's memoir, especially the salamanders and the frogs uh, preferring water, that surely must reflect back to Wagner himself. Six years later, however, by which time Siegfried had reached nine, we find this 22nd July entry in Cosina's increasingly voluminous diary. At lunch, a dismal occurrence. Fiddy behaves badly towards his father. The dreadful thought that he might prove unworthy of him takes possession of me. And this thought, instead of being turned against myself in, re in resigned acknowledgement of original sin, turns inside me against my child. And I hit him so violently that it causes bruises. No words, not even my sobs can express the horror I feel about myself. Oh, fortunate people who lived in times when one could atone. In this instance, as always, Richard, heavenly toward me. And as you can hear, 
uh, characteristically restrained uh, reserved language of Cosima. And all Siegfried and his siblings appear to have enjoyed their childhood and some youthful compositions date from about 1882. After he completed his secondary education in 1889, Cosima arranged for Siegfried to take several music lessons a week from Engelbert Humperdinck, a Bayreuth disciple and a composer who lived not far from Frankfurt in Mainz. He studied with Wagner's former pupil, oh, sorry, and many of his works have been said to resemble Humperdinck more than they resemble those of his own father. Would we have heard of Leop, no, here we go. Whose father is that? Anyone want to answer? You can turn your microphone on if you can say who it is. Mozart. Which one? Which Mozart? Sorry, which Mozart? It's the father of the Mozart. Oh, he's the father of the Mozart. I didn't hear the preceding cut. Yes, would we have heard of Leopold Mozart but for his famous son? And would we have heard of Siegfried Wagner but for his equally famous father? Indeed, would we have heard of either Ludwig Geyer or the police actuary Karl Friedrich Wilhelm Wagner, but for Richard Wagner himself. So there's, now whose children are these? Anyone know who their father is? Three, two, one, okay. Now do you know? Anyone? Freud? Yes, Sigmund Freud. Martin Freud, on to the right, the eldest son of Sigmund seemed to resign to his fate as the son of the famous father when he described as idyllic his childhood in Vienna around the dawn of the 20th century. He said, I've never had any ambition to rise to eminence. I've been quite happy and content to bask in reflected glory. I believe that if the son of a great and famous father wants to get anywhere in this world, he must follow the advice given to Alice by the Red Queen. He will have to go twice as fast if he does not want to stop where he is. The son of a genius remains always the son of a genius and his chances of winning human approval of anything uh, he may do hardly exist if he attempts to make any claim to a fame detached from that of his father. Martin's only claim to fame was as a devoted son. He headed his father's publishing firm, handles his father's finances and legal affairs. And likewise, Anna Sigmund to the left, uh, Sigmund's daughter, sorry, uh, re relegated to being her father's nurse, companion, secretary, co-worker and shield against the intrusions of the world. 1935, during a period of illness, Freud wrote that the one bright spot in my life is the success of Anna's work, which was, of course, to look after her father. Now, sometimes the children of famous parents are themselves famous. And we see on the left, of course, Elizabeth I, and the right, her dad, Henry VIII, rather ornately clad, I think. Um, and here's another pair. Um, Kirk Douglas and Michael Douglas, obviously equally famous and successful. Uh, Carrie Fisher, the Hollywood actress, uh, Debbie Reynolds' daughter, had lamented her excessively public childhood, saying, when I was less than a month old, I was already featured in the press, and it hadn't really stopped ever since. The big question is, what kind of independent life can the offspring of a hugely famous parent be expected to be able to lead, and how is that potentially compromised? Now, does anyone know whose family this is? Box. Box, yeah. Yes. Now, have you ever heard of Gottfried Heinrich? How detachedly and dispassionately can we appraise a work by Gottfried Heinrich or Wilhelm Friedman or Karl Philipp Emanuel or Johann Christian or Johann Christoph Friedrich, all sons of Bach, once we know who their dad was? It is said that the sins of the father are visited upon the son. Was a towering success and immortality of Johann Sebastian. See, I didn't even need to utter his surname for you to immediately know who he was. Was that visited upon his hapless progeny? Like the sons of Bach, Siegfried Wagner had the most prodigious pedigree that any composer could dream of having had. Not only was he the grandson of Franz Liszt through Cosima, he was of course the son of Richard Wagner and through familial connections and prestige was able to take some instructions from in harmony from this, and after the death of Richard, composition lessons from Humperdy, a long time Wagner devotee organized by Cosima. Despite working in a different musical era, however, Siegfried lived under the long shadow of his father all his life, thereby attracting the jealousy of rivals. It is easy to see how the young Siegfried would have, have trouble 
establishing his male identity, an ultra-sensitive only son with four doting sisters and a dominant overprotective mother, had barely any contact with lads his own age. Yet six months after Siegfried's birth, his father had warned that the boy would eventually have to meet other people and misbehave himself. Otherwise, he'll become a dreamer, said Wagner, maybe an idiot like the King of Bavaria, a rather shabby jive about his greatest benefactor. Wagner left the care of his children mostly to Cosima and died just when his son was entering adolescence. Aged 13 and idolized to death, Siegfried was suddenly the only man in the family. The issue of whether the gender of a famous parent is the same as their offspring appears to have an impact according to the study Children of the Famous Parents by Sabrika Maheshwari. When the child is the opposite sex, the child can have difficulty resolving interpersonal Oedipal issues, comparing potential mates with their famous parent. Charlie Chaplin, on the other hand, wrote of his thrill in competing with his father for the same women. By dint of his gender, Siegfried had, had bestowed upon him from birth the mantle of the presumed line of succession to Richard as director of the festival at Festspielhaus. Yet Richard, and to a lesser extent, a more stiff-backed Cosimo, were willing to allow their children considerable latitude. When it came to a choice between lessons and sweets, as we have seen, Cosimo would occasionally cave to her more lenient and benevolent spouse. Wagner had thought his son might become a surgeon or an architect. Indeed, despite his early training and intense interest in music, Siegfried Wagner studied architecture in Berlin and Karlsruhe for two years and toured the world as far as India with a friend, the English composer Clement Harris, in the course of his training exposure to design. And there's none other than Clement Harris himself. On its website, the Society for Hellenism and Philhellenism uh, pays homage to Harris who lived from 1871 to 1897, to whom they describe, whom they describe as having fought like a hero and died for the independence of Greece in the Greco-Turkish War of 1897. Clement Harris was a wealthy and charismatic English pianist and composer. Uh, he studied music at Frankfurt with Clara Schumann, was also a friend of Oscar Wilde. It was with Harris that Siegfried had his first known homoerotic encounter, and through Harris that he decided to choose a composing and conducting career. While on board, he sketched the symphonic tone poem Sen 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 sorry, inspired by the poem of the same name by Friedrich Schiller. This piece was not, com piece was not completed until just before he conducted its premiere in London in 1995. Um, and here is a bit of it. By 1892, Siegfried had returned to Bayreuth to begin four years of work under his mother and the conductor Hans Richter with the intention that he would one day become Bayreuth's director. In 1896, he became associate conductor, sharing responsibility for conducting the ring cycle with Felix Myrtle and Hans Richter, who had conducted its premiere 20 years earlier. During this period, he also composed the first of his 18 operas, the Berenreuther, 
Five years later, he staged The Flying Dutchman. In 1908, he took over as artistic director of the Bayreuth Festival in succession to his mother, Cosima, but didn't assume full control until 1924, six years before his death. By 1908, a quarter of a century after his master's death, the festival was going strong. The leadership had passed smoothly, or was passing smoothly. I don't know if it ever completely passed smoothly from Cosima to Siegfried, and the family was, for once, seriously rich. Siegfried was considered one of Germany's most eligible bachelors, notwithstanding speculation as to why he was still a bachelor at age 39. His mother, the Hohe Frau, was now 71. She had suffered a heart attack and was half blind. In other respects, all was far from well with the Wagners. While the Italian branch of the family was settled with Blandine in Florence and her sons doing well following her husband's death a decade earlier, Daniela's marriage was on the rocks, perhaps unintentionally assisted by Cosima. This, this is more than can be said for her calculated efforts to destroy the marriage of Isolde in context of a court case, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and the, uh, in the context of which Isolde's name could not be so much as whispered, lest it give Cosima another attack. It was Cosima's ever solicitous son who was firmest in insisting that Mama's welfare must not thus be put at risk, although in his case his solicitous may not have been entirely altru altruistic. And solicitous though he was, he was not around when his mother died. Secret at that time was in his element. As a festival producer and director, he was popular with both the public and with performers. The very first, first, the very first opera he composed, Fair and Right, had been hailed as an outstanding hit. Yet Siegfried had still felt threatened by Isolde, the Isolde wing of the Wagner clan, leading him to conclude his slim 1922 memoirs with the uncharacteristically sad note, I do not feel like a tragic figure, as though this was being suggested. He goes on, I rejoice every day that I had the good fortune to have a father such as mine. I rejoice to have had such a mother and grandmother. I love my sisters who give their brother nothing but love and kindness. I'm happy that I am not quite without talent and have in inherited a liberal dose of humor from my parents. Dear reader, he goes on, do you think that anyone who has so much to be grateful for can be a pit pitiable, tragic figure? I certainly don't. Similarly effusive declarations appear so often in Siegfried's short autobiography that his dear readers may suspect he doth protest too much. In Jonathan Carr's tell-all book, The Wagner Clan, published on the day of his own death, he questions why someone who called his life so blissful would allow bleak topics like illegitimacy and child murder to dominate his operas. Indeed, during Oscar Wilde's catastrophic libel trial against the Marquess of Queensbury, his bestseller, A Picture of Dorian Gray, was defended against accusations of licentiousness by his counsel, Sir Edward Clark, who explained, a great many books have been written about crimes, but it has not been suggested that the authors of those books have a predilection for committing those crimes. Otherwise, Agatha Christie would be in a lot of trouble. Jonathan Gower goes on to say, of course, composers can and often do write sad music when their lives seem outwardly joyful and vice versa. But in Siegfried's case, the contrast looks especially, especially crass. Was the sunny public image maintained through thick and thin simply show? Not altogether, Siegfried surely did inherit a lot of humor. Uh, although despite his beautiful, beautiful references to my parents, precious little of it can have flowed his way from his austere mother. His private letters are full of wit, puns, and gentle irony, often directed against himself. Much the same is true of the way he ran the festival, even if there was calculation as well as personal inclination behind his relaxed approach. He would often arrive beaming for rehearsals, dressed in plus fours and yellow stockings as though just dropping by on his way to the race course, then standing about chatting cheerfully until everyone is at ease. Siegfried, in other words, in no way belonged to the Terror Works Best School, either as producer or conductor. Once the real business began, he was tireless and exacting. But even then, his frequent jokes would bolster a discouraged singer or disarm an enraged maestro. And when he could not avoid enforcing discipline among his children, as he tended to call the cast, he used a light touch, not a bludgeon. What a contrast to the fortress on the hill ethos of the Cosima era. Indeed, for hard-line Wagnerians, the laid-back style of the new boss, master's son or not, seemed close to sacrilege, but then Siegfried despised nothing more than hardliners in music or in anything else. Sometimes he railed against supposed allies who are more papal than the Pope. But usually he kept his blood pressure down by seeing the funny side of things. He smirked to learn of the woman who chanted, Bar des sein Horn, was that his horn? From Goethe Demerung every time her husband blew his nose. 
And he rightly reflected that in the beginning of the unpleasant bulk, and sorry, in view of the unpleasing bulk of some Wagnerian singers, it might be best to ban opera classes from Bayreuth. For all his love of his father's work, Siegfried seemed only too happy when he could escape to hear Donizetti, Verdi, even Bizet, the composer shunned at Weinfried, at least since the hated Nietzsche wrote De Paul Wagner, in which he praised the sharply etched tragedy of Carmen at the expense of the master's fog-bound music dramas. More shocking still, on one occasion during a boring supper given in his honor in Nuremberg, Siegfried slipped away to a nearby nightclub featuring a jazz band, the last word in decadence for the old Wagnerian guard. Worst of all, he actually enjoyed it. Interesting comment there from Jonathan Carr. I do recommend the book, by the way, uh, The Wagner Clan. In 1915, the 18 year old Proline Klintworth, or Klintworth, married the by then 46 year old Siegfried thus joining the scariest cultural dynasty in the Kaiser's Reich, one that could match the 1980s TV series Dynasty or Dallas for intrigue and drama. Born Winifred Marjorie Williams after she was sent, sorry, Win Williams, after she was sent, oh, my namesake of course, after she was sent from a Sussex orphanage to Berlin to be looked after by elderly distant relations named Klintwort, Winifred became German by adoption. In Winifred, the Klintworts had inculcated the spirit of blood and soil, and for the rest of her life she remained in Bayreuth, her newfound spiritual home, devoted to the memories of Adolf Hitler and Richard Wagner until her death in 1980. And there she is with Siegfried. It was hoped that Siegfried's marriage would end the costly scandals caused by his homosexual encounters. This headlong step into marriage astonished, I'm just going to admit somebody, uh, astonished where am I? Himself. This headlong step into marriage is Thomas perhaps himself more than anyone. anyone. His bride was no noble woman, no opera singer, but an 18 year old English orphan. Some observers knowingly claimed to be rather boyish looking. Boyish or otherwise, Siegfried sighed four children with her. And there they are. See the adoring wife there. Um, and here's a little video that backgrounds this. Dem gab es natürlich den Sohn des Meisters, Siegfried Wagner. Damals war er schon weit über 40 und unverheiratet noch. Das heißt, das ganze Haus Wagner war zwar altehrwürdig, aber es war überhaupt keine Aussicht auf ein Enkelkind des Meisters, das heißt auf eine Nachfolge der Herrschaft im Hause Warnfried. Der homosexuelle Siegfried, der sich erfolglos als Dirigent und Komponist versucht, denkt gar nicht daran zu heiraten. Schließlich fügt er sich aber doch der Familienraison. 1914 kommt Winifred Williams mit ihrem Adoptivvater Karl Klintwort nach Bayreuth. Das englische Waisenkind war von dem entfernten Verwandten in Berlin aufgenommen und im Geist Richard Wagners erzogen worden. Der Wagner-Clan erkennt in der 17-jährigen Winifred sofort die ideale Frau für Siegfried, jung, mittellos und der Wagnerschen Musik treu ergeben. Die beiden heiraten und Winifred bringt 1917 den ersehnten Erben Wieland zur Welt. Drei weitere Kinder folgen. Friedelind, Wolfgang und Verena. It is possible that Siegfried married Winifred for dynastic purposes other under family pressure because the Bayreuth festival was desperate for male heirs. So Siegfried finally produced him with a teenager at a time when he was norm, almost 50. During the previous two decades, he had refused the hand of several other prospects. His marital relations with Winifred were in any event the sort of familial duty that had been carried on in the bedchambers of monarchs arranged marriages forever and a day. The stud does what's expected of him and then hives off to enjoy himself elsewhere. And thus, after obediently having married Winifred, Siegfried remained an active homosexual. Pity the hapless female cast into the torturous role of rent a womb and unrequited love. A fifth so-called illegitimate son called Aigen, A-I-G-N, has been linked with Siegfried. However, this source is apocryphal. No evidence has ever been adduced to corroborate either this claim or that of the putative love affair with the singer Marguerite de Norvina. At the time Siegfried could allegedly have sired A and he was in fact having, hiring, avidly hiring male prostitutes at 
the Monte Carlo Casino. About a year later, another male prostitute plying his wares in Monte Carlo blackmailed Siegfried. It's far more likely that Ayn was a younger flame of Siegfried's who offered up yeoman service on the Bayreuth casting couch to earn his ticket to work at the festival. He was by no means the first to have done so. Reviewing Bridget Ham, Ham, sorry, Hamann's biography, Winifred Wagner for the New York Times in 2007, we'll see a bit of her in a minute. Uh, Jeffrey Wickroff described Siegfried's marriage to Winifred as problematic. Quite apart from the age gap, his homosexuality was well known and dangerous. It was a criminal offense at the time, so marrying Winifred looked like a cover. He managed nevertheless to brace himself and father four children, Wieland, Friedland, Wolfgang, and Verena at a rate of one per annum from 1917 to 1920. Winifred was still raring for more, but Siegfried put his foot down. Happily for the first of all, Wieland and Wolfgang went on to perpetuate the Bajor dynasty, or dynasty if you prefer the American and English pronunciation, with the latter retiring as recently as 2008, two years before his death. Frederick Wolfgang, of course. In May 1942, Hitler later mused aloud to Goebbels that Siegfried had been made to marry in a hurry because of his homosexuality, yet only a short while earlier, it had described Siegfried as a personal friend, albeit politically passive. Of course, the fact that Siegfried was having gay affairs at the time doesn't ipso facto preclude that he might also be having straight ones. That's what bisexuals do. Until his letters are released by the present day Wagner's unexpurgated, we may never have the full picture. And even then it's possible Siegfried's amorous secrets died along with him. Notwithstanding that he penned 14 full length operas and sketched four more, 10 orchestral works, including a violin concerto and a symphony, symphony. Because the junior Wagner lacked his father's indomitable egocentricity and towering genius, he is less well known than, the otherwise, than he otherwise perhaps should have been. Sadly, his works are often sneered at frequently by people who have never heard them. Uh, moreover, the Wagner family would have been in no position to promote his works after the end of the World War II, with the future of the festival in, much in doubt. And here's uh, his, his symphony in C major was composed in 1925, so a reasonably late work uh, and revised in 1927. Play a bit of it. <laughs> movement. Thank you, issue of the 13th chord, which is very much with our volume. Skip forward a bit more.
and so on. So um, might remind you a bit of his father's uh, own uh, his only symphony, I successfully sent off to Mendelssohn, which sparked a whole lot of things. Okay, so you, you may detect certain parallels with Richard's effort at a symphony uh, that many considered that in nowadays jejune by comparison with his operatic opus. And here's a catalogue of Siegfried's operas that just for someone to have been 18 operas and have none of them performed is quite an achievement um, considering um, whose who his father was. Um, so I'll just skip across and uh, we'll have a look at his orchestral works as well. And we've just heard a symphony. You can see that's in the list there, fairly well done. Um, and we've also, also heard a little bit of Sensuk, the symphonic poem after Schiller. We also read quite a bit of vocal music, uh, which you can see there. And uh, so, now, the Berenhorte, this was uh, Siegfried's first successful and probably only successful opera. Um, in his own lifetime, aside from the sets of uh, Berenhorte that had been conducted by Mahler, Siegfried's operas were not greatly esteemed. In fact, Mahler refused all of Siegfried's requests to conduct his subsequent opera. So this one is conducted by, it was originally, but not in this recording, uh, this one is conducted by Carl Byrne. Oh, I do beg your pardon, it's conducted by Siegfried. That's, this is a Siegfried recording. Okay, um, Debussy said uh, Siegfried's opera sounded like the work of a Wagner student whom his teacher did not consider very promising. It appears that for a gifted son to choose the same path as his brilliant father is to attract humiliation. Siegfried was also out of step with the music of his time with the rise of modernism. Nevertheless, Schoenberg praised his composition calling Siegfried perhaps backhandedly a more profound and original artist than many today who are more famous. I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. Sometimes too long, over, often with over intricate plots, unexpectedly hard to perform at their best. On the rare occasions when the works are given at all, Siegfried's operas can bring an audience cheering to its feet. I've placed a few tracks from uh, a later work, a uh, later opera, Reinhold von Adelaisia, which is another very obscure piece that I'll quickly skim through just to give you an idea. Hearing a bit more of the father in that, I think. There's a bit more here. Oh. 
Sometimes it sounds like Mozart. Here's another scene. Schade, dass es keine Göttin der Dummheit gibt. Denn sie wäre vor allen verehrt und geliebt. An tausend Stellen stünden Tempelkapellen. And so on. So I'll just skip forward to scene 21. Aside from his compositions, much remains unknown about Siegfried's life, both personal and professional. His jocular and at times self-deprecating tone at home, at work and in print appears to mask the internal intensity of his true feelings for reasons already previously disclosed. And it's possible that in the present age, he may have enjoyed entirely different marital arrangements that would have been not only unthinkable, but criminal at the dawn of the last century. When Richard Wagner died, the festival he had created for his operas was inherited by Cosima, who guarded it long and fiercely. Siegfried took full control only in 1924, as mentioned, when the festival finally reopened after World War I, but he was dead within six years of having done so. Uh, alongside his role as the, Bay at the Bayreuth, sorry, as boss of the Bayreuth Festival, Siegfried was also a busy conductor and producer. Just look at all these conducting engagements. Um, I've just listed a few here, 1896, almost every year he's doing, like, these are major engagements, like big pieces, and to do like, six of them in the same year, it's, I presume they're all in Bayreuth. See Lohengrin twice. Uh, he wasn't necessarily widely praised for all of these, but um, Now the last one, Tannhäuser, was one that was hugely praised. In fact, on his deathbed, he found out that it was a roaring success. Um, so that was a nice way to exit this earth. Uh, contemporary views vary widely about Siegfried's conducting. He wielded his baton with his left hand, which confused some players until he eventually swapped. Richard Strauss dismissed his conducting as miserable as did Mahler after hearing the Bayreuth Ring in 1896. However, Strauss had fallen out with Siegfried uh, calling Bayreuth a pigsty to end all pigsties, so perhaps there was more to it than merely uh, a criticism of Siegfried's conducting. He said that in a letter, by the way, to his fiancée, Strauss said that in a letter to his fiancée Pauline, the notorious soprano. Other critics were really ecstatic. However, when the young maestro showed up at London's Queen Hall, George Bernard Shaw, none other, compared him favourably with Richter and Myrtle no mean names, and pronounced himself touched, charmed, more than satisfied. The dozen or so pieces Siegfried recorded in the, his last years support Shaw's view, in particular his lucid interpretation of the eponymous Siegfried Ittel, matches reports of his master's own conducting, witnessed on his, at least three occasions by Siegfried as a boy. Um, in the last five years of his life, Siegfried be began recording, and many survive. Um, here's a list of them. Between 1925 and 30, you can see. Uh, all of these are available on YouTube, by the way. And something from military band right at the end. Um, what a way to go. No discourse concerning Siegfried Wagner would be complete without finding out where he stood in relation to he whose name shall not be mentioned. Of course, you know who I mean. Uh, his name has already been mentioned. Siegfried never joined the Nazi party and unlike Ch Stuart Chamberlain, he was not obsessed with its ideology. According to Winifred's own correspondence, Siegfried repeatedly but unsuccessfully tried to stop her attending Hitler's rallies. However, he eventually must have resigned himself to the private contact between the Nazi leader and his wife. Uh, she had befriended the young Hitler even before his jailed 1923 putsch, and he remained close to the Wagner's after he came to power 10 years later. Siegfried's surviving, surviving family would use the informal du instead of sie with the man they called Wolf and treated as an uncle. 
there, there's Wunderfritz and Hitler, and on the right you can see Wieland looking downwards for whatever reason. After Siegfried and Winifred had arrived at the Munich Hotel once to find an ecstatic Hitler waiting in the lobby, Siegfried noted, unfortunately, Volk present in his diary. He went off alone to the theater and left the pair to spend the evening together. On another occasion, Siegfried actually took Winifred all the way to a restaurant where she was to lunch with Wolf, but then went off on his own to eat elsewhere. It is possible that he had reached a tacit understanding with Winifred wherein she could have her own private life while he could pursue his own amorous and artistic affairs. That doesn't necessarily imply that Winifred slept with Wolf. Indeed, she later expressed, expressly denied having done so. And here she was doing just that. And then came my grandmother, Winifred. Ich bin 1897 von britischen Eltern in Hastings. I was born in 1897 of British parents in Hastings. Sadly, both my parents died before I was two, and so, aged four, I found myself sent to Germany. Married to the 54-year-old Wagner's son, this young woman was lonely, and when Hitler had attempted to seize power in Munich and the putsch had failed, there was a great commotion. The very good friend was missing, and then she heard he was in Landsberg prison. I asked what he needed. He said lots of writing paper, so I sent a whole load of paper from our house, Villa Wanfried. And my God, now people tell me I supplied the paper for Hitler to write Mein Kampf. Almost as if I am responsible for Mein Kampf being written. I called him Wolf, and he called me Winnie. We had a very close relationship, as did the children. They all called him Wolf as well. It was a purely human and private relationship. I must confess, he made a very deep impression on me, as a personality. His eyes were especially attractive, very blue, large and expressive. And I asked him to our house, Villa Wanfried, after I learnt he was very interested in and knowledgeable about Wagner, and he wanted to see Wagner's house and his grave. After Siegfried's death, and despite his will, there was much speculation that Hitler and Winifred would marry. However, despite all his outward charisma, Hitler's involvement with women tended to stop at the bedroom door. Even Eva Braun, his longtime companion, seems to have been more of a mascot than a mistress, according to Hitler's housekeeping staff. Yet he clearly offered Winifred thrills her husband could not. Like Hitler, uh, Goebbels was awed by the Weinfried heirlooms and was much fascinated by Winifred. He wrote of her in his diary, they should all be like that and fanatically on our side. Sweet children, we're all friends right away. She pours out her sorrow to me. Siegfried is so spineless, she says. Yeah, shame on him. Feminine, good natured, somewhat decadent. Rather like a cowardly artist, does such a thing exist? Goebbels found it difficult to price himself loose from Winifred at the end of his stay in the hall and in the garden. She was crying in the garden. He recorded, a young woman weeps because his, the son is not as the master was. Had Siegfried not been his master's son, the Fuhrer would surely have been much nastier about his record. When an anti-Semitic newspaper demanded that Jews be barred from the festival in future, Siegfried Lent sent a long letter of reply, stressing that the Jews had often supported Bayreuth when supercilious Germans had failed to do so. If the Jews are willing to help us, that is doubly meritorious, Siegfried added, because my father in his writings attacked and offended them. They would therefore have, and they do have, every reason to hate Bayreuth. Yet in spite of my father's attacks, a great many of them revere my father's art with genuine enthusiasm. On our Bayreuth Hill, we want to do positive work, not negative. Whenever a man is Chinese, Negro, American, Indian, or Jew, that is a matter of complete indifference to us. As for his father's notoriously acerbic anti-Semitic pamphlet, Das Judentum und der Musik, Wagner had proposed assimilation, not genocide, and hence was not remotely predictive of what Hitler stood for. Siegfried later reiterated these views in an exchange of letters with a Bayreuth rabbi. The rabbi responded that while Siegfried had much to learn about Judaism, he was glad to find he did not share the rabid anti-Semitism of some of those who'd married into the Wagner family, notably Chamberlain. Hitler can hardly have missed seeing an open letter that Siegfried issued to the press in February 1925, pledging that 
everyone, whatever religious belief or race he may have, is welcome in Bayreuth. No, need, no one need worry that any unpleasant incidents will occur. This was an oblique reference to the preceding festival where Nazis had spat on visiting Jews, daubed swastikas on buildings and thrust anti-Semitic leaflets into the hands of passers-by. At the festival theater, the audience had risen at the end of Meistersinger to intone Deutschland über alles, which provoked Siegfried into pinning up notices, discouraging such demonstrations on the grounds that here is art that counts. When the public in 1925 burst into song anyway, Siegfried had the lights turned off. It could be argued that Siegfried's letters defending Jews might have been ploys to try to ensure that the vital Jewish support for Bayreuth could continue. The festival was still shaky. The Wagner's US tour a year earlier had barely yielded a profit in, in part because of Jewish financiers' disgust at Weinfried's contacts with the Nazis. Especially after the anti-Semitic outrages in the 1924 festival, Siegfried still tried to reassure Bayreuth's wealthy foreign and Jewish friends. Be that as it may, the more defiantly that Siegfried came out in support of Jews, the more he ran into problems. The Richard, the Richard Wagner Association struggling to raise funds from, for the festival. They deplored Siegfried's engagement of Jewish artists, regardless of how outstanding they might be. Hitler in particular squirmed through his first attendance at the Bayreuth Ring declaring that having the Jewish Friedrich Spohr, Shaw portray Wotan was racial des desecration. Yet, when writing to a friend in 1921, Siegfried said, I must admit one can really work much better with Jews. They are far more intensive and ambitious in their work, and once they've learned something, they've got it for good. Siegfried claimed that Jews had achieved the success they had because they supported one another and wished his own work and that of Bayreuth could enjoy comparable solidarity from Germany, from Germans. Uh, he called them so-called Germans. Uh, evidently, Siegfried was speaking from the heart. By 1924-25, Siegfried had gone completely off Wolf and did not want him on the Wahnfried premises. He must have sensed where Germany might plunge were the Nazis to win control. For a dinner in 1925, not sorry, 1929, to celebrate his 60th birthday, Siegfried placed the libretto of his new opera, The Little Curse That Everybody Bears on every guest's plate. One of the nastiest characters in the piece is a robber baron called Wolf. With such diametrically oppositional views on the Nazi threat to German democracy, one can only imagine what a fly on the wall would have thought of the marital dialogue that went on between Winifred and Siegfried. Siegfried died in 1930, only four months after his mother, she 92, him he 61. But his widow, Winifred, uh, talking, taking after Cosima, outlived him for another nearly 50 years. Since their two sons were still only adolescents, Siegfried was succeeded at the helm by Winifred. On his 75th birthday, Siegfried's widow received a telegram from three of her grandchildren telling her to drop dead, something she obliged them by doing nine years later. Perhaps the jury is still out on Siegfried Wagner. Certainly we can only imagine what sort of an architect he might have made, or indeed how he would have been viewed as a musician, but for the omnipresence of an all too famous father. But in researching for this talk, my res res respect for the man increased by the hour. An abundance of personal modesty alongside qualities of tolerance, balance and irony are sometimes char uh, are characteristics not always historically associated with the name of Wagner. Moreover, apart from his compositions, Siegfried's gifts were manifold. He was possessed of a photographic memory and a fine sense of color and design such that he might have been an architect had his, has been his main aim until his early twenties when he met Clement Harris. Certainly, these attributes served him well as a producer, a pragmatic innovator whose impact on Bayreuth stagings over decades culminated in legendary Tannhäuser in 1930, which, as I mentioned, he was told of its great success. When the Tannhäuser production in 1930 uh, demonstrated that Siegfried, as a director, was open to a contemporary style of staging, he learned of the success in hospital after having suffered of a heart attack, died on the 4th of August, 1930. I'm going to close with a rare recording of none other than Richard Wagner conducting excerpts from uh, Tristan and Isolde. Uh, Thomas Edison had developed his tinfoil phonograph in 1878 and made, it made its way to Europe in that year. This rare Edison recording with Wagner conducting is the only recorded example of the composer interpreting one of his own works. 
and see if you can hear the influence of Wagner's conducting on Siegfried's. Second extract is the love duet um, restored in inverted commas <laughs> um, using the cedar process. This is the Bayreuth possible opportunity. Thank you. 
Okay, I just dropped the screen share now. Everyone's still there? <laughs> I see a few faces. Sleepy eyes. Okay. Uh, so um, that's a bit of a walk through secret. It's uh, very hard to find as much about secret. Every time you type in Siegfried Wagner in a search, <coughs> Wagner's Siegfried comes up, the, the opera from the ring. So <coughs> I didn't dig quite deep to find the information. So has anyone got any comments to make that, uh, about what they've seen? First of all, thank you from California for that rare recording of Wagner conducting. I didn't know it existed. I never heard of it. And it's really a very interesting artifact and uh, a tremendous insight. Getting back to Siegfried, the, uh, the other Siegfried, the one that you talked about. Yes. Uh, so he did not join the Nazi party and in fact seemed to be sort of against the Nazis. Yes. And he wrote against them uh, consistently and um, did not want Hitler to come into the house and discouraged all the public displays of nationalism, let alone anti-Semitism at Bayreuth. And it wasn't until he died that, um, that Winifred was able to just basically fall into the arms, perhaps literally, we will never know. There's so much writing from Siegfried uh, opposing supporting the Jews who at that stage were investors in Bayreuth and performers. In fact, Wagner himself, oh, someone's playing something. Um, well, Wagner himself, although he wrote that terrible pamphlet and was a notorious anti-Semite, Hermann Levy, who conducted uh, most of his great works, um, was Jewish and son of a rabbi. And uh, the first Siegfried and the first, uh, Someone's playing something in the background. I can hear music playing somewhere. Can everyone mute their microphones except the person I'm talking to? Can you all hear that? Yes, I hear some background noise. My question is, where do you think Siegfried got this from? His father, at least in his writing, was an anti-Semite. Yes. So how did Siegfried get this? How did he get this humanistic nature? Was it from his mother or from friends or from his education? Where did he get that anti-father <laughs> approach from? Yes, it seems to me that he wasn't anti his father. I mean, you read what he wrote about him, although it's been suggested that it could be, you know, he doth protest too much as observed by Jonathan Carr. But he does seem to love his father. And you see the photograph, uh, I, didn't, I forgot to put that on this uh, presentation. There's a lovely photograph of Wagner with his arm around Siegfried um, and there's a genuine affection there, and Siegfried looks happy with him, and his description is hilarious um, in the memoir. So I think Wagner had a sense of humor, there's no doubt about it. And Cosima was very, as I mentioned, ancien regime when it came to child discipline, but she always capitulated to Richard. Richard was the lenient one, wanted them to go and have to go out and misbehave themselves, and to use his own words. Um, I think the, the, the thing is that they were surrounded by Jews because. Um, Tosig lived in the house as a 19-year-old Jewish pianist. Uh, Rivenstein was there. Um, and Julie Schwab invested money in Wagner's works. And, uh, and uh, Porges, another uh, producer, uh, also Jewish. The first Siegfried and the first uh, Brunhilde were Jews, picked by Wagner. And the conductor, a close personal friend, he died in his arms practically, even, well, the, the day, late, day later. So Siegfried was surrounded by Jews who he knew as friends. So, Whatever Wagner wrote down, it's been suggested that he might have been the, uh, the son of Ludwig Geyer and not perhaps the police actuary, uh, Wagner. Uh, be that as it may, well, if, if that were the case, then it might suggest if he thought that might be dangerous to be Jewish in the ascending climate of anti-Semitism, that he should um, you know, protest too much himself. Um, but. I just absolutely, well, he and his uh, Das Jordentum in der Musik never uh, advocated it as Luther had done um, for Jews to be exterminated. He wanted them to be assimilated and to become part of Germany, uh, fully incorporated as distinct from having their own. He, in fact, he tried to convert all his Jewish friends to Christianity, succeeded with precisely zero, but there you go. 
Any other comments? Is that all you wanted to say, by the way? Oh, thank you for an excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? You can just uh, turn the microphone, I think. Yes, De Derek, thank you very much indeed for a really excellent talk. Um, Hi, Richard. Yeah, I've, I've heard the view expressed that of all of Wagner's descendants, uh, Siegfried is by some way the, the greatest or the, the best um, artistic um, fo follower and together with some very derogatory comments about the others. Um, I was just wondering whether you held that view as well. Well, uh, he's of course the father or the grandfather of the present day Wagner's too. I mean, the Wieland and Wolfgang's progeny are now running the festival or were. I think still are uh, Katerina and Eva are direct descendants. So um, they, they're very benign. But, well, I don't know if you know them personally, but Katerina and Eva are lovely to speak to. And very, they come to all the uh, RWVI festivals, uh, the Congress, um, and they're totally supportive. So um, you know, there's review opinions on their directing different. This Nikki is sort of estranged a bit from, and there was always the the problem that Wolfgang threw away everything Wieland had done when he died. Yes. Uh, evicted them from Barnfried, which they dormant for some time. It's now a museum, of course. Uh, but yes, I do think Siegfried uh, would have prospered much more in present day society. He would have not been forced to marry someone for dynastic purposes. Although it does appear that they got on, okay, um, to the extent of fathering four children, but that was, you know, bang, 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 duty's done, and then he went back to having boyfriends. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what, what it would have been like for him. Now. Really, you can only speculate. Times are so different then. And, and anti-Semitism was normal then. It wasn't something that uh, was in any way, you wouldn't have been frowned upon. Uh, although when uh, Wagner published, I think the second version of Das Judentum de Musique, and uh, and Meistersinger was staged uh, in the production organized by Porges, who was also Jewish. The, uh, the audience hissed at uh, Wagner because of his anti Semitic writings. So it wasn't necessarily ubiquitous at that part stage. And there's a whole theory behind that, which I gave already in another talk, which you can welcome to look at on academia.edu. Uh, I went into that in great deal of detail. Much has been written about that. Uh, but yes, I think um, Siegfried was. Um, I think he might deserve a reappraisal, and I played very short snippets, and a lot of it sounds like a combination of early Wagner, Mendelssohn, um, Weber, Mozart, and Gilbert and Sullivan, really. But then you could accuse any opera composer of being like that because scenes have to match certain moods, and you can't write uh, the the Volga boatman when someone's uh, playing in the garden. So it's, the music's got a, it's not necessarily cartoon like, but it has to bear some resemblance to the thing, like motif or otherwise, uh, the scene that's or the person or character or emotion that's representing. Thank you very much. While I have the floor, may, may I just um, ask um, the the photograph you showed with the Wagners at, at Varnfried, uh, there was some people there I didn't recognize. Could, would you be able to go back to that? Is that convenient or is that? Uh, I'll just see if I can quickly get that up. So how far back was it? Um, <clears throat> it's probably about six slides into the show, something like that. Okay. So is this the one with them standing up the step on the steps? Yes, that's right. I'll just briefly share the screen again. Again, <laughs> again share screen. Can you see that? Yes, that's it. Who, who's the, the man on the sort of squatting down on the right hand side? That almost looks like Rick. Does anyone know who that is? That Siegfried is a boy. That could even be Richter, couldn't it? Or maybe not. No, he's got his black hair because Richter, I think, was grey haired by then. Anyone know? It, it, it almost looks like, I don't know, um, Tolst. Uh, um, what am I looking for? Um, not not started. 
uh, <laughs> um, or, or some Russian writer. Yes. Anyway. Gotcha. Yes. And the uh, the youngest gentleman uh, next to um, um, Cosima, who's that? Uh, sorry, just going to look for the uh, for captions for the. Oh, maybe this is it. No, I'm trying to find because I've got that out of Jonathan Carr book, and I just can't find. I don't. Maybe it's on the photocopy. No. Gosh, oh, here we are. Here we are. No, it's not there either. It might be on Wikipedia somewhere. Yeah, sorry to Actually, put it on the spot. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. If you go onto Wikipedia, I'm sure you'll see that photo in the, uh, somewhere in one of the Wagner pages. There's quite a few of them. Uh, he's got his own page on Wikipedia. He's got a separate page for his operas. Uh, but there's one for Eva, one for uh, Katerina, one for Richard, obviously. And we, everyone that sort of hives off to the, umbilical connections is there. So I honestly don't know who they all are, but... No, not to worry. Okay, uh, obviously Pratima at the back. Anyone else have anything that... I'll just stop the share there. Stop the share! It's like a Wagner rally, isn't it? <laughs> so not a Wagner rally, I mean a uh, Trump rally. <laughs> stop the steal. <laughs> so any other comments? I must have preemptively answered everyone's questions. Derek. Richard, yes. Yeah, um, do you know if the operas are performed in Germany? They, according to no. what I've been able to read, yes, they are occasionally. When they do, people rise to their feet. Uh, not to leave the theatre, but to say, well done, old being very old now, deceased being. Yeah, um, I've not actually, I couldn't find though, I, I was looking for a video of even one of the operas being performed and I couldn't find one to save myself. So if you do come across any, I'd be really interested to, in fact, if anyone uh, knows of a recording of, of, of ideally a performance of the whole, a staged version of any of these shows. But the problem is, again, if, if I may, Derek, is yes. that, when, why play an image, not an imitation, but a, a second rate version of, of something when you can have the real thing, when you can have a father? That's, that's oh, the, yes. well, there you go. That goes to my opening point about the yes. sons of famous fathers yes. and how they can never be. But, you know, and as I also pointed out, some, sometimes the offspring of famous parents can themselves go on to be greater still. And Leopold was, Mozart was well known in his own time as the. You know, had this violin school, wrote a treatise on violin playing, but his children, Nan Earl and uh, Wolfgang were hugely, obviously more famous. And he's only famous because they were. And uh, yes, I, I think that you'll find lots of examples of where that, and th sadly also the female half of a lot of these pairings, both sibling and marital, buried the, the women uh, who are often very fine composers and obviously Nan Earl, who was apparently equally brilliant to her brother, just disappeared off the planet. Um, Nanny, sorry, Fanny, getting Nanny and Fanny mixed up, Fanny Mendelssohn, fine composer as well, never hear of her, great, great songs. Um, Alma Mahler was the most uh, disgraceful example of a buried spouse. She was an extraordinary composer and in terms of leader, I would put her ahead of Gustav actually. They had a the marital contract, Gustav said, uh, the deal is you're the housewife, you're my supporter, I'm the composer. If you agree to that, we'll get married. And that, you know, we know how long that lasts. I think it went about the sixth symphony, it was falling to pieces. But yes, it was completely biased against uh, women. Maybe Hello, Derek. Hi, Michael. Hello. Hello. Yes. Just to, <laughs> just to, <laughs> <laughs> Just to make a point about musical families, I think it's it's also quite interesting to note when um, parents aren't as encouraging sometimes of of their of their offspring, and I think an interesting one to to note in that is the Strauss family, and how Johann Strauss Senior, the father, composer of the Radetzky March, 
was adamant that none of his um, children were going to go into music, what with it being a disreputable profession at the time. And as a result, they wanted them all to become bankers and um, very reputable middle class. Um, and as a result, of course, um, Johann Strauss Jr. set up quite a lot, set up his own um, orchestra to compete with his father's. Um, <laughs> And I think it was a lot more successful as a result. So I don't know if they, I think it was eventually a reconciliation, but it was just a, a, an interesting point about musical families you might have missed. Yes, that, that is a good point. I think uh, Handel also was discouraged from being a musician by his father. They wanted him to be an actuary or a notary public or something mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. benign. And um, it's also when, when musical families disagree with each other. And I think referring to the Bach family, the, the, the important one, is the disagreements, but is is the the sort of um, is C P E Bach, who was the I think one of the younger Bach sons who moved to London, of course, and he became um, he 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 wrote a dossier called the True Art of Playing Keyboard Instruments, where he basically um, he basically went against all of his dad's teachings, and said this is this is not how to do things, <laughs> and virtuosity isn't everything. Yes, it's, you can almost think that, uh, that a parent might overtly discourage their child from doing something so as to make sure that they really want to do it. There's a famous example I've forgotten now, but you know the, the uh, drummer Buddy Rich, uh, to change genres momentarily, was horribly abused and beaten by his father all the time and told he would amount to nothing and ended up uh, becoming the world's most famous drummer of the day. Another one that might be interesting to know about, uh, this is how I remembered it now, you know the uh, Weatherspoons chain of restaurants? This may be apocryphal, but uh, you would think that Weatherspoon would be named after Mr. or, Miss or Mrs. Weatherspoon. It's actually not named after uh, the owner of the restaurant, but named after his teacher. And so you might think, well, must have been a very fine teacher to be memorialized across every library come X bank come food chain in the United Kingdom. No, again, uh, Mr. Weatherspoon was a, a dystopian and draconian dysmorphic teacher, uh, misanthropic teacher who told uh, the owner of the restaurant, whose name I don't even know, <laughs> you'll never amount to anything. So just to make the point, uh, Weatherspoon's name as the most discouraging teacher in UK history is now blazing across every uh, such restaurant in the United Kingdom. And maybe that was uh, done uh, by design, I don't know. Discourage and then they'll rise above you. Um, I don't think that's uh, something that parents would should take on board personally. It was never done to me. I didn't get where I am today by being whatever, you know, the <laughs> CJ, remember the, uh, the Paul and Rise original parent? Maybe not, because that was uh, maybe for your time. But <laughs> Very. Remember that, Paul and Rise, yes. Uh, on that note, before we expand into other uh, fat familial uh, <laughs> discussions, I think uh, we should uh, all thank you greatly for this scholarly approach, uh, vast amount of information that you've given us about um, uh, Siegfried Wagner. Uh, I should say uh, to the other to, to the other viewers that. Uh, they should know that you have stood in at the last moment. We were due to be listening to uh, Paul Dawson Bowling talking about um, Rienzi uh, on this occasion, but Paul is, is indisposed at the moment. You kindly stood in. Um, you've done a vast amount of, of scholarly work on this subject, and we're all uh, most grateful to you. Uh, and um, thank you uh, most sincerely. Uh, and, and, Last but not least, as I mentioned in the introduction, you handle you you also handle all the Zoom technology, which makes the whole thing possible. And we're grateful to you for that. So thank you very much, for, for Derek, and we we uh, will end the meeting there. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, John.